Okay, I'm glad you're here this evening and those that are online. Welcome to you. We'll prepare ourselves in our usual way this, this evening by having a few moments of silent prayer. By the way, today is November the 18th, 2021. And uh, let's prepare ourselves uh, for God's Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful <coughs> for your word that never changes. We thank you that you've given us the ability to understand it. It's alive and powerful. We thank you that we have this nice place to come where we're comfortable and that the, your word will have its way in our life. We're so thankful that you are the one that directs our steps and that you have untold wonderful blessings for us but we need to learn your word grow in grace and knowledge and we have that chance to do it again yet tonight so we're thankful for that and pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate for we pray this in jesus name amen <clears throat> excuse me if you'll open your bibles to romans Romans chapter 5 and we're going to ver uh, start with verse 17 actually we've already been in <coughs> verse 17 Let's skip, we have a lot to cover tonight. We've already done verse 18 and 19. Let's skip down to, let's see, verse 19. Romans chapter 5, verse 19. We began verse 19 Tuesday, so we'll begin there. I would get rid of that little, that heading up at the top, but <clears throat> the little icon for that is disappeared. Yeah, uh, I don't know why, but my computer likes to have little tricks to play on me. But at least we have the scripture here. Romans chapter 5, verse 19. For as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one the many will may be made righteous. Now you should, <coughs> at this point, Remember what this is all about. We are contrasting uh, Adam and what he did with Jesus Christ and what he did. And we already pointed out that verse 18 refers to all men, where here it refers to many. Many were made sinners and many will be made righteous. And so this is good we hear this one more time again. Some people claim that since it says the many is not referring to everyone, but Robert Mounts in his New American Commentary has this paragraph here that really helps us to understand this. He says the Greek term translated many should be taken in the inclusive sense of its Hebrew counterpart to mean all, just like it was in verse 18, all who are in fact many. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that many doesn't refer to all, but you can have all and have just a few. But this is talking about all in the fact that there are many, many. <coughs> Uh, 
Let's just skip down here. We'll just go to this last verse here. This verse, verse 19, emphasizes the importance of obedience. We live in a time where disobedience is the norm, and it is rampant. People these days feel free to do as they please. They completely ignore those in authority because they are confident that they will not be held accountable. This is playing out right now in real time. Uh, the Rittenhouse trial is going on, and they brought in, what was it, uh, 500 or was it 1,000 uh, troops? The National Guard, 500? 500 National uh, Guard, and they're already having uh, skirmishes in front of the courthouse. They're just waiting for a verdict, and if it doesn't go the way that the... Uh, scoundrels want it to go, then the idea is that they're going to burn down Kenosha again, whatever is left that they didn't get the first time. Why do they do that? Because they're not afraid of being held accountable for nobody in a certain uh, group is ever held accountable these days. But I can assure you that God holds people accountable and he will deal with them in his time in his way. So we're talking about uh, disobedience. And so <clears throat> we start our lesson tonight here with Lesson 140. Disobedience brings death and cursing, but obedience brings righteousness and blessing. Have you ever noticed that especially young people who are disobedient and they're arrogant and they are uh, out of control. You ever you notice they usually don't live that long? And today, especially with the drug problem we have and fentanyl, which is deadly, we have a, they say it is a drug uh, crisis, but the crisis really is in the home. These children weren't brought up properly. They weren't taught anything about the Bible or <coughs> the... Uh, good manners and thoughtfulness and respect. They just uh, go out in the streets and buy this stuff and they say, you don't even know what you're getting these days. You can be, they could say it's a certain drug, it's something else and it can kill you. <clears throat> but obedience brings righteousness and blessings. Here we have Romans 6.16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience... You are slaves of the one you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Now, where it says either of sin resulting in death, many times that's literal. People die because they are uh, sinful. They don't obey God. They don't obey anybody. But it doesn't have to be physical death. There is a death resulting from disobedience, disobedience to God, whereby you are walking around, you're doing your own thing, you're ignoring God, and you are just as dead as a doornail when it comes to being in touch with reality, to understand why you're here and where you're going. They don't know any of those things. And so just because you're breathing and you're walking around, you're living a life, doesn't mean you're alive because the Bible says that you're dead. You're spiritually dead. That means you're separated from God. And that's a horrible place to be. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. That is spiritual death. And we talked about this at the end Tuesday night. You can put in there, uh, For the wages of Adam's sin is death, and that is spiritual death. <clears throat> but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now this is very interesting because let's look at our verse again, and I'm going to highlight the things that I'm going to point out here. Verse 19 says, For as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners... Even so, through the obedience of one, the many will be made righteous. So we're looking at these two terms that are complementary of each other, and that they're laid out the same. And so 
were made sinners. Now, the morphology of this verb, made, is an aorist passive indicative. That means that we were made sinners in a point in time. And the passive voice, that's the P in that little thing I have there, is very interesting because we didn't do anything in order to receive the imputation of Adam's original sin. That's why it's in the passive voice. We received condemnation. We didn't do anything to be condemned other than receive Adam's original sin. And then we have the indicative mood, which is the I, which means it is a reality. So we were made sinners through the imputation of Adam's original sin to all mankind. Now, by now, this should be really sinking in to you in your mind so that you'll be able to explain this to others. But a word of warning. Don't go to someone that knows nothing about the Bible and for the most part doesn't care, might not even be saved. You don't want to talk about even one of these phrases here were made sinners or will be made righteous they can't understand it. They have no frame of reference. But for those who want to know, you should be able to explain to them that God never, in a, in a positional sense, condemns us for our sins. We were condemned for Adam's sin. And there was a reason for it. We're going to go into great detail tonight. So the air is passive indicative. We received something in a point of time, and it was reality, and what it was with the imputation of Adam's original sin to all mankind. That's how all were made sinners. Then we have a very similar phrase that, that uh, comes up next, which says, will be made righteous. Let's go up here again and look at it. I want you to see them in here. For as through one man's disobedience, which was Adam's, the many were made sinners. They received the imputation of Adam's sin. Even so, through the obedience of one, of course a capital O, meaning that it was referring to Jesus Christ, the many will be made righteous. And let's look at this one in morphology of that verb. So, will be made righteous is a verb. It's a future passive and in indicative. <clears throat> So, the future tense, of course, means this is going on in the future. Will be made, and again, this is something we receive. We don't do anything to be made righteous. God makes us righteous whenever we put our faith alone in Jesus Christ, we're justified. We're justified because we were made righteous because he imputes to us his own righteousness. Indicative mood mean reality. So we didn't do anything in order to be condemned. We didn't do anything in order to receive God's righteousness because it was in his plan that this would unfold for every person for all time on earth. This is the way it functions. And few believers understand this. And if you don't understand it, then you don't have as much appreciation to God as you should because this is the most wonderful thing he could do is to condemn us for Adam's sin and then to make us righteous through Christ's work on the cross. Okay, now let me ask you something. Do you all have your thinking caps on? Huh? Because we're going to go to the seven imputations. And the seven imputations, some of you have seen this, some of you have not. But it's God's plan. And by the way, it's on the website as well. Uh, God's plan. And so I'm going to show it to you here as soon as I can bring it up. And I, this, is a, <coughs> this is as big as I could get it, so I hope that y'all will be able to see it. Now, when you see that, don't think it's a horrible formula and, and just, just drop out. <clears throat> this is a visual of the seven imputations that are in 
God's plan for us. First, we'll do just an overview, just a flyover to see what this is about. So we have up here in the green, the unbeliever. In the blue, we have the believer. And in the red, we have the mature believer. When I was taught this, it was called X plus Y plus Z. X plus Y plus Z. Now, it wasn't put in this way. I put it this way I thought would make it easier to understand. I hope that that is true. <clears throat> but we all start out as an unbeliever. But what have we learned? That we are born physically alive, spiritually dead. We are spiritually dead because God imputed Adam's original sin to us and we are condemned at birth. So this is talking about imputations at physical birth. Right here, imputations at physical birth. And that's what we call X. We start out with soul life here that is imputed to biological life. Soul life comes from God and is given to us. It's imputed to us to biological life at the moment of, of, of birth. I know this is very controversial. But <clears throat> some people say, well, uh, the soul was given to the, the two parents were giving the soul to the uh, zygote uh, the moment of conception. I, I believe they gave him physical life, but soul life comes from God. We have a soul, but we don't create souls. It would be hard for parents to create a soul, I think, because the, cro uh, the soul is created out of nothing. You try to create something out of nothing, and you'll see that's hard, hard trick. So we're born physically alive with the soul here, and we have Adam's original sin that is imputed to our old sin nature. Now we have three strikes against us when we're born because we have imputed sin, we have inherited by biological sin, you could call it, through our genes, and then we have personal sins. So <clears throat> Adam's original sin went to our old sin nature. See, Adam's original sin is what condemns us uh, spiritually. And did I say Adam's original sin? I didn't mean to say that. I meant, yeah, Adam's original sin is what condemns us spiritually, and the old sin nature condemns us physically. In our genes, I mean, you can't get a microscope and see it, but when Adam sinned, he developed an old sin nature, and that old sin nature is passed on genetically from person to person. Actually, it's the male that does it. And so Adam's original sin plus the old sin nature, this, goes, this has an affinity here, here. Now, this sets up a potential here. So, the, this imputation here means we have human life plus Adam's original sin, uh, sin means that we are spiritually dead. Now, if we add the gospel to these things, we're physically alive, spiritually dead, and if you add the gospel, that equals potential number one. So every person that is ever born has this potential because they're born physically alive. They're born spiritually dead because of Adam's original sin computed to us. What they need is the gospel. And when they hear the gospel equals a potential number one. Well, what is the potential? Here's the potential down here, salvation, to go from spiritually dead to spiritually alive. But what is in between the potential and salvation here is plus faith in Jesus Christ. So when we have, we're physically alive, spiritually dead, we hear the gospel, we ha and when, you, when a person hears the gospel, there is a potential. When you give an accurate gospel, then God the Holy Spirit steps in and makes that spiritual phenomenon understandable, clear, perspicuous. 
to the person so they understand it. They're spiritually dead, but because God makes it clear to them, there is a potential. And the potential is that they will receive salvation. How? By faith in Jesus Christ. You add faith here. And you'll notice this salvation is turned to blue and everything over here is blue. So the moment this potential becomes a reality through faith in Christ, then you have salvation. Is So far in X that I've given you are all on, okay, is it clear? So the moment that you believe the gospel, you have salvation. Yet Now you go up here, now you're a believer. So you had two imputations here that enabled you to have a potential. You believe in Jesus Christ. Now you're up here and you're a believer. And that is why God's plan continually moves on. So now you're a believer. And these are imputations at spiritual birth. These were imputations at physical birth. These are imputations at spiritual birth. Where did the spiritual birth occur? Or when? Right up here. When you had faith in Jesus Christ, you were born again. John chapter 3. Now you, you had already been born physically. Now when you believe in Jesus Christ, you have been born spiritually. So these are imputations that take, take place. But before we get to these, we're going to go up here. You notice these are all in round circles. These are in rectangles. It looks like a, a box and a rectangle. These are called ju judicial imputations. It's, it's a judicial decision. These have affinities. Soul life goes to biological life. Adam's original sin goes to the old sin nature. But up here, we have personal sins. Our personal sins went to Jesus Christ on the cross. Do they go there? Did Jesus Christ? Did he deserve our personal sins to be imputed to him? No. That's why it's called a judicial imputation. Now, why was our personal sins able to go to Jesus Christ? Because God didn't condemn us for our sins. He condemned us for Adam's sins, which freed our sins to be imputed to Jesus Christ so he could take our punishment on himself. Now, we have another judicial imputation, is God's righteousness is imputed to the believer. Here we have God's righteousness. See, we are a believer now, so it goes to us, and this is plus R refers to God's own righteousness. Now, why did we end up with God's righteousness. There's something on this chart here. There's something there that I can point to that shows why we have his righteousness. Can you tell me where it is? Do you know where it is? Right here. When we had faith in Jesus Christ, that's when God imputed his righteousness to us. So we're a believer with God's righteousness at that point by way of imputation. So in judicial in judicial imputations, they come in pairs. For Christ to have our personal sins go, go to Jesus Christ would not be just. For us to receive God's righteousness without our personal sins going to Jesus Christ would not be just. But when you have the two of them together, that Christ gets personal sins that he did not deserve, and we get God's righteousness that we did not deserve, then they fit. Then they're balanced, and it's just. So here we are now. We've been born again, and we have God's own righteousness, and that righteousness is has an affinity with the grace pipeline. I'll show you that in a minute. And we have eternal life that is impute, imputed to the human spirit. By the way, did you have a human spirit before you had faith in Jesus Christ? No. 
look at what, we, what they call dichotomous. We had a soul and we had a body. But when you are born again, then God gives us a human spirit. And so eternal life goes to our human spirit, which there's a, there's a fit there. They belong here now. So we have eternal life through the human spirit and the believer with righteousness goes here. Tell me something about the righteousness and eternal life were imputed. How much did they cost? They're free? <laughs> They're free for us. It wasn't free for God uh, to provide them. But that's an important point too. We received the, the righteousness of God that was credited to our account and we received eternal life that we cannot lose all because we had faith in Jesus Christ. So they are a gift. We did nothing to deserve them. And somebody says, yeah, but you believe in Jesus Christ. Faith is non-meritorious. There is no merit in faith. The one that gets the, the credit is the object of your faith. So as it turns out, <clears throat> We had faith in Jesus Christ. It doesn't, it doesn't merit anything. But it means that God can give us his own righteousness and eternal life and many other things. It is Jesus Christ that gets the merit always. So now we go down here and in under Y we have plus R, which is God's righteousness. And we have EL, which is eternal life, plus BD. What is BD? Bible doctrine. Now, Bible doctrine here sets up a potential, which is the second potential. Here was the, the first potential was be, have salvation, become a believer. Now we have a second potential. But before we move on, what happens if you have righteousness imputed, eternal life imputed, but you don't have any Bible doctrine? What does that mean? <laughs> uh, Y'all are sounding too much like me. Um, it means that there is no potential. Having and how many millions of millions of believers? See, every believer has this when he believes in Jesus Christ. At least church age believers have his own righteousness and eternal life, but they never get any doctrine. So the potential down here is never realized. Does that mean that they're not going to go to heaven? No. But they're missing out, even in time. So the potential is right here. I don't know if you can see that from where you are. It says super grace blessings in time. The grace pipeline is all about logistical grace. I can show it to you in a moment, which every believer has. Every believer, regardless of whether they care about Jesus Christ, what they're Behaviors, nothing matters. They are God's child and he's going to provide logistical grace, which means the grace that they need in order to fulfill his plan for their life. But this is super grace blessings in time. Over and above. That is the potential. So when is it that they receive the super grace blessings in time? That potential here, potential two, is realized when they have been good and faithful servants and taking in the word, they have reached spiritual maturity, and boom, that potential is not a potential anymore. It becomes a reality. And then that potential as a believer here is done. But we're not done yet. We go up here to Z. Now, Z is referring to the mature believer. This is only for people who are mature believers who have already received super grace blessings in time. More grace than average believers receive. James chapter 4, verse 6, I think, is where it talks about uh, super grace blessings. Now we're up here as mature believers, and now we had... Imputations at physical birth, imputations at spiritual birth. Now we have imputations in eternity. Now we're already out of this veil. We're 
in what is coming next. So here are the imputations. In Z, you have eternal life that we received here. You have super grace blessings that re uh, occurred here. By the way, everybody has eternal life, but not everybody, I'm talking about all believers have eternal life, but not all believers have super grace blessings. So if you have eternal life and you have God's own righteousness, but you don't have super grace blessings, forget it, none of this applies to you. Super grace blessings come when? When you mature spiritually. When is that? I don't know. God knows. You'll know it, though, when you're getting super grace blessings. They are so phenomenal. So we have eternal life plus super grace blessing goes down here to the believer with plus, with plus our righteousness. That is up here. This, when you have eternal life, super grace blessings, and God's own righteousness, <coughs> you have eternal life plus blessings in time plus BD. What is BD? You mean you're a mature believer and you're thinking about what's going to happen in eternity and you still need Bible doctrine? You mean you don't reach a point where you don't need it anymore? <laughs> of, course, of course we need it. So you're faithful in continuing to take in God's words, which equals potential three. It's just a potential at this point. But if you continue to the end, being good and faithful servant to God, then this last potential, number three, is going to become a reality to you. And right down here, it says, see, this says SG blessings in time. Well, this says SG blessings in time, but the SG isn't the same here. This is super grace, grace blessings. This is surpassing grace blessings in eternity. They surpass super grace blessings or anything else you can ever think of. It's so wonderful. It's beyond our comprehension. And that is the potential. That's where God wants to take unbelievers all the way to here. And he can do it. But you have to have faith in Jesus Christ. You have to have Doctrine, you have to have doctrine, and eventually, in the, the greatest thing about surpassing grace blessings in eternity is that they are what? Tell, tell me what they are. So they are eternal. How about that, huh? Yeah. And they are wonderful. So there you have it. And I have here in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for those who are believe in Jesus Christ, who love Jesus Christ, who all this. Well, that's what, that's what he wants. All these things. Whenever you're living your life and you're up and down, up and down, and going through tests and all, all these things, it is all for the good and the good, what God wants for all of us, is surpassing grace, blessings, in eternity. That's big. Are y'all... Still awake? Okay. <clears throat> By the way, this is on the website on under visuals. I had one earlier, this one right here. And it's essentially the same. I've changed it a little bit. But uh, it, it's good to see the uh, judicial sins are in boxes here. It's still super grace blessings, uh, surpassing grace blessings in eternity, super grace blessings in time, becoming a new believer. It's essentially the same, but I like this one better because uh, <clears throat> I like this portion up here uh, that, that shows. Now, we were talking about the grace pipeline a moment ago, right here, in uh, the believer with uh, plus R, God's righteousness, the grace pipeline is associated with God's righteousness, and I'll show you why. <clears throat> Here's the grace pipeline. This is what it's about up here at the top on the left. God blesses sinful man without compromising his perfect justice and righteousness. That's the problem. How can God bless us when we're such wretched people? How, how can he... He can't bless us. Now, we can do good things, but our good works are as filthy rags to him. How can he bless us? 
Everybody thinks, well, he did such a great thing, God's going to bless him. God cannot bless anyone unless it goes through the grace pipeline. We are not blessed because of what we do for God, but because of what God does for us. Remember this. What the justice of God requires, excuse me, what the righteousness of God requires, the justice of God carries out. Righteous makes the demand, justice carries it out. And in this case, God's righteousness has already demanded that justice carry out uh, blessings for us. So this is the way it looks like. All these things are things that we can contribute in order to get blessings. Morality, witnessing, prayer, giving, service, sincerity, emotionalism, self-righteousness, <coughs> tithing, sacrifice, social action. I have tithing in there twice. Talent and personality. All these things would try to get into a break this pipeline where the justice of God is going to bless us through God's righteousness. The target here is God's righteousness. You see right here it says blessings, logistical grace. Every believer gets these, logistical grace. That's why over here in this other thing here, we saw the believer with righteousness goes to the grace pipeline and that's true for every believer because <clears throat> God is blessing his own righteousness in us. That's why he does not compromise his, compromise his perfect essence. We can never in a million years be able to earn anything from God because we're wretched creatures. So when he blesses us, he blesses us because we have his righteousness. And that blessing goes right straight to his righteousness and he is not compromised. And this is imputed to every believer. Here's a few verses uh, that have to do with the grace pipeline. Matthew 6, 33. Romans 3, 21 and 22. Romans 4, 3 through 5. And Philippians 3, 9. So even though we have talent, we have personality, we pray, we give, we do all these things, it has nothing to do with God's righteousness because these are things that we do. God blesses us on the fact that we have his righteousness. So remember this. We are not blessed because of what we do for God, but because of what God has done for us. What did he do for us? He gave us his own righteousness and one of the aspects of that own righteousness is the fact that nothing that we do merits his righteousness. That way, he's not compromising his perfect essence, and yet we are blessed. You see, if any of these things penetrated this pipeline here, uh, let's say tithing, if that would penetrate it there, it'd, it'd be horrible because... People would go around, well, yeah, I'm really best. Look how much money I gave to the church. That can never be said legitimately because nothing can penetrate that pipeline. It's sealed because God's justice is carrying out the command from God to bless us. Why? Because we have God's righteousness. One other thing I have here, I think. <clears throat> i got to drink some water. I'm getting this course. The three types of sin I talked about a while ago, they're on the website as well, on the visuals. You ought to go to visuals. I got about a hundred of them. So there's three types. First of all, we have imputed sin. God imputed Adam's original sin to our genetically inherited old sin nature at the point of birth, which resulted in our condemnation. You have Romans 3.23. Anybody know what Romans 3.23 says? For the wages of sin is, uh, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, then we have inherited sin. When Adam fell, he acquired an old sin nature. We inherit this old sin nature, which is a tendency to sin from ge genetic perpetuation. And then with three, we have personal sin. Sins we commit from our own volition, we sin because we choose to sin. Whether we know it is a sin, when we commit it, it makes no difference. 
So, where's my pointer? I'm going to put him in what's in my pocket. Uh, are these two sins different than this sin? Yes, they are different. God uses these sins to condemn us so that he can take these sins and charge them to Christ on the cross. That way he could pay for our penalty because we were never condemned for our own sins. Now, you could, the bottom line of this is that you can be absolutely right and true if you tell people that they're afraid that they're going to hell. Why do people think they're going to hell? Because of sin. And you can look them right in the eye and says, thus says the Lord, nobody goes to hell for their sins. Have you ever done that? You ought to try it sometimes. It gets exciting. People blow up like a big bowfish. But, well, that's absurd. And when they start bloviating about how absurd that is, just ask them one question. Why did Jesus Christ go to the cross if we are going to hell for our sins? Did he or did he not pay for our sins on the cross? That's not a big elaborate thing, is it? But I guarantee you, you will plant a little pebble in their shoe. They're going to think about that. First of all, when they recover from shock. They wouldn't think anybody would ever actually say that. And I'm trying to explain to you that you can tell them with authority and dogmatism. Tell them just, I challenge you to show me anywhere where someone is condemned to the lake of fire for their sins. The Bible says I could give you a half a dozen places to talk about it. It does not. And yet you have all these people that are working hard in order to be saved. And all their work means that they are not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. They think that their works have to be added to it. But it's given as a gift. If I was going to give you a gift, and I said, well, here's your gift, and you said, oh, thank you. And you said, and I said to you, well, that'd be uh, $20.85. What would you do? You ought to do that sometimes to somebody. That would be a, young, a good thing to show a young person something. Your uh, grandfather or grandmother or a, a mother or father, and you guess out of the blue, you give them a gift. You say, hey, this is for you. I want you to have it. It's a gift. And you give it to them. And let's say, let's say it costs $10. You owe me $10. Even a child can understand, well, I thought it was a gift. Well, I guess you're right. I can't charge you, can I? And when Jesus Christ was on the cross and he said it's finished, it means the gift of eternal life, the gift of God's own righteousness, and they're called gifts in the Bible. Verses, they're all over the place. Okay. I still have some time left. Now, y'all bound to have a question or a comment or something. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now, we're going to get back over here to Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Here we are. I knew that was going to take some time. I have so many things I was hoping to get to, to tonight, but I'm not. Now, the, if you go to countrybiblechurch.us and go to the top band there where it says visuals, you can go, and they're all listed in alphabetical order. Uh, the, the first one, I think, says seven imputations. That's the one, one of them. The one that I was showing you at the last, I, says, I think, says X plus Y plus Z. And you can look at those and go over them. Everything I showed you tonight was on the uh, visuals. 
Oh, well, no, but you can just look at what it is and follow it through. Yeah. Um, Romans 5.20, And the law, referring to the Mosaic law, came in that the transgression might increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Now, can you tell me why when the law came in that transgressions increased? Well, how did that happen? You would think when the law came in, people would start being more law-abiding, wouldn't you? Well, here's, the, here's, here's how it unfolds here. When the law is referring to the Mosaic law, Moses gave the law to the Israelites. When the Mosaic law came in, transgressions increased. Now there would be 613 commandments to keep. They went from zero to 613 commandments. I don't know who counted them. I'm not going to check them. I'm just, I'll go with that one. 613 commandments in the Mosaic law. So there are a lot more ways to sin. With these new laws, the number of sins, of sins greatly increased, which exposed how sin permeates every aspect of life. The depravity of man became obvious, and thus the need for a Savior. That was the main purpose of the law, was to show the people they could not keep it. And since they could not keep it, they needed help. They needed a Savior. Romans 7, 7 says, quote, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be! Exclamation point. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So you can see how the sins increased. When the law was written, sin increased because it revealed many things that the people were doing as sinful which were not even considered sinful before. It wasn't until Moses, Moses was about 1500 A.D., and there was no written law until that time. And so people were doing a lot of things that they didn't really think were sins. B.C., I'm sorry. Thank you, Pete. 1500 B.C. So then they recognized, I've been doing this all that time, and... I got, I got by with it, but I can't get by with it anymore because the law says it's a sin. So the Mosaic law demonstrated that man is exceedingly sinful and cannot live up to God's standard of conduct. That's what it explained. People came to the conclusion that it was impossible to keep the law, but they learned that what was impossible for man was possible for God. That's what the law... Of course, the law gave them all that they needed in order to become a nation. They had been a slave for 430 years. Okay. For nothing will be impossible with God. They also learned, because look at the last part of our verse here. And the Mosaic law came in that the transgression might increase. But where the sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that's what we're looking at now. And so they also learned that where sin increased, God, uh, grace abounded more. Have you seen this before? God's grace is always greater than our sins. This is the one that I gave you about a month or so, a month or two ago in major Bible events. Uh-oh, I left a goal race. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> go. <laughs> I, I think there's some kind of bug that gets in here and changes my letters around. Let's see. I need an E here. Oh, I need I need a big E. Okay. Now this is the one y'all have already seen. Grace. Oh, wow. Grace. 
need a A here. That's nothing. Okay. See, this is what happened. I have, you see, this is grandiose. It's supposed to be spectacular for you to see. And when I left it, I think it was spelled right, but who knows. So, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So God's grace is always greater than our sins, but I always have to say, that's not a challenge. You don't have to prove that to be true. If you do, It's okay. We got to go in. Thank you, Brett. Okay, we got just a few minutes left here. Now, here's a verse that substantiates what I have here. By the way, these are in bold and they're red for us to remember that. Don't ever forget that God's grace is greater than our sins. So when we acknowledge our sins, His grace is going to cover it. And His grace is always greater than our need. So whatever our need may be, no matter how desperate it may be, God's grace is greater. Important. Here's a verse that substantiates that. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. You notice the H is capitalized. This is Jesus talking to Paul when he had a thorn in the flesh, and Paul kept asking him to, to remove it. It's not what wasn't a literal, a literal thorn, some kind of ailment. And God said, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. God's power is magnified in weakness. And so Paul said, Well, I hope I'm really weak because I want that power. I uh, paraphrase. No matter how odious a sin may be or how much sin increases, it can never exceed the grace of God. Now here again is, is the last part. We're talking about the law that came in and sin increased. This gives you a perspective of it. <clears throat> Galatians 3.24 and through 26. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So there was a time when they needed a tutor. What does a tutor do? He teaches. He's trying to get something across. And that's what the law was. It was trying to get across the point that you cannot keep the law. Uh, you can't keep it perfectly. Only one person ever did, and that was Jesus Christ. So it was as a tutor to get you to understand that so that we can be justified by faith. See, it said you cannot keep the law. You can't be saved by the law. It wasn't designed for that. It was designed to show you that you need a Savior. And so it says, it led us to Christ that we may be justified by faith and not by trying to keep the law. But now that faith has come, now they understand. Someone like Paul has come along and explaining to them you don't need a tutor anymore because I've given you scripture. I've told you personally that the only way that you can be right with God is by faith, not keeping the law. You can't keep it anyway. 
But now faith has come. We are no longer under a tutor. We are not under the Mosaic law, period. For you are all sons of, Christ, uh, sons of God through keeping the law. Oh, well, no, it doesn't say that, does it? For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We're going to end right here, and it's a good point to break it off. The law was never intended to provide salvation, but to convince people of their need for it. The Mosaic law, law acted as a tutor to lead people to Jesus Christ. They learned that they could not be saved by keeping the law. They needed a Savior. Once they were justified before God by faith, they no longer needed the Mosaic law as a tutor. Okay. I hope your head is not spinning. Now, do you feel confident that you can go out and say, tell somebody in your family or some acquaintance or a stranger, whoever it may be, can, can you say, you know, I want to teach you something uh, I, I want to tell you something about X plus Y plus Z. Are y'all ready for that? <laughs> That's the plan of God in seven imputations. That's the way that God uh, has designed his plan to work. And what's so beautiful about the plan, he's moving us forward every time. We go from an unbeliever to a believer. We go from a believer to a mature believer. We go from a mature believer to a place of super abundant, surpassing grace blessings in eternity. So we all are moving forward. God, what have we been learning in Genesis? God is always behind the scenes and he's working on your behalf. The tests are not to make you grumpy. The tests are not for you to hate. The tests are for your benefit that you can demonstrate by applying the things you've learned from the Bible to your circumstances. And when that happens, then God can say, okay, now you're ready for the next level of my plan for your life. And you go to the next level. And are there going to be tests there too? Oh yeah, there's going to be tests. But when you continue to go up and up and up, you're going to get to the point to where you have super grace blessings. God is going to use you in a phenomenal way here on earth so that whenever you pass this veil of tears because you were good and faithful your entire uh, spiritual life from the time you were born again, then you have all these things that are surpassing grace blessings to look forward to. We call it the personal sense of eternal destiny. All of us should be making decisions now not for the next day, week, or year, or whatever it is, we should be making decisions that are going to accrue to us the surpassing grace blessings in eternity. That's what, when we're making decisions now because we're thinking about how that's going to affect us in eternity, you're on the right road because that's what's very important. That's what's going to last. When you make decisions for uh, tomorrow, the next day, whatever, they're gone, they're dead. We think about eternity because it is going to be here sooner than we know. It's right around the corner. Yeah. Okay, any questions before I close? Oh, it's already time to close. Got to close anyway. Father, we are so thankful for your plan. When we think about in eternity past how you knew each one of us, you designed a plan specifically for us that's perfect for us, and yet we can't advance without being taught. We have to be humble to be teachable. And when we learn your plan, when we grow in knowledge, then you advance us in your plan. And your plan is phenomenal. So we thank you for that and pray that you will help us to think about these things. We can't inculcate these things in one or two or three or four times looking at it, we have to really meditate about it and think about it. And you will open our minds and you will give us the blessings that 
come from you on the basis of our righteousness. The righteousness, the righteousness that you gave us. And so we're thankful for these things and we pray that you will help us to not forget them, but to concentrate on them. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.